Good afternoon. We will be taking questions throughout today's presentation via chat box. If you would like to ask an audio question, please press star 1. Tony, please go ahead. Hey everyone, I'm Tony Rivera. I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator of the Reed Foundation. Uh, today's webinar is Adapting Life with Candace Cable. She's a pioneer in the sport of wheelchair racing and a 12-time Paralympic medalist who attends the Paralympic Games as a journalist. She also is a contributing member to the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation online community. She writes blogs within the Life After Process section for over four years. She also represented the Reed Foundation during the CRPD event at the United Nations. I'd like to turn it over to Candice. What's up, Candice? Hey, Tony, thanks. Thanks for that introduction, and thanks everybody for joining us live and also in the archives. I have to apologize to you if you were really hoping we were going to talk about quad rugby because my guest uh, didn't realize that the date was also going to be the same date that they were in Washington, D.C., meeting the president and the vice president and first lady and partying on. So we ended up having to come up with something else for this webinar, and I decided to do a recap. So we don't really have any guests, but a recap of, um, of the Paralympic Games that I just attended, which was my 13th Paralympic Games that I attended. So again, apologies to everyone if you're hoping for rugby, because I really wanted to talk about some of the things that were going on with changes that were happening with rugby. But um, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll be able to get them back in and be able to sit down and, and have a little chat about how the Federal Paralympics went and what's going on with rugby, some of the changes. So adapting sports, I mean, um, adapting sports, that's actually how this webinar got started a few years back when we switched it to adapting life, is really about being able to offer up some new ideas about how we can do the best possible life experience for ourselves and others. And I think one of them is if someone can get involved with sports, sports is one of those things that really can enhance our lives. And the Paralympic Games is really one of the events, it's actually the third largest event in the world, sporting event in the world, that actually has a huge social impact no matter where it goes and whatever country or city that it's held in because it cannot not have a social impact because those cities that bid for the Olympic and Paralympic Games and hold those games will be required to create accessibility on all levels and inclusion. And so they have to figure out through help from past cities that have held the games and the International Paralympic Committee, they have to figure out how they're going to do that. And it really relates to culture when they do it. So that's one of the cool things about the games, the Olympics and the Paralympic Games being held in different countries and cities, is that if you have the opportunity to watch those games or even go there in person, you'll be able to experience a whole different type of culture. And Brazil did not disappoint, to be sure. Rio has its own unique culture. And, and one of the pieces that they brought to the table was really the environment. I mean, right here is the mascot, Tom. And Tom is he's really a fusion of all these different plants that they have in the forest in Brazil. And he came to life through an explosion of happiness. That's his backstory when he found out this Paralympic Games were coming to Rio. And so all of the, the different banners and the clothing that the volunteers wore and the staff all had to do with Rio's lush life and forest atmosphere as well as beaches that really are the backdrop for all of the games. And there are going to be a few pictures of, of some of the things outdoors because some new sports like triathlon and kayak and canoe were added and they're on the water. As, and there were multiple other areas where you got to interact in the environment, which really was an unusual environment, this being the very first games that was ever in South America. So this time, I went nine times as a Paralympian to compete in the games. I went once as an athlete services coordinator to work for the USOC in the Vancouver Village, taking care of athletes. And then I went 
twice as a journalist and writing about the games for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. And this time, I went as a member of the LA 2024 team to bring the games to Los Angeles in 2024. So this is a big group. And I was named vice chair of this big group in the month of February, I think. So it was uh, about six months ago almost that they asked me to be vice chair. And so what happens right now is that this big group, as well as three other cities, Paris, Rome, and Budapest, are bidding to hold the games in 2024. And they have several requirements that they have to do to be able to do this. And one is attending the games and learning how the games happen. And learning how the games happen is part of an observer's program. And it's really back of the house, front of the house, how did they put it together, what worked, what didn't work, and and everything in between. So one of the things that we get from the observer's program, which is so interesting, is again, their culture. Like what kind of culture they have and how it presented them to, presented itself when they organized the games. And one of the things, I mean, if you watch the Olympic Games or the Paralympic Games on television, you heard about things that weren't quite ready or stuff that was happening that wasn't supposed to happen. And the Brazilians, right off the top of the day when we started the observers program said they said we do everything last minute we wait till the last minute to do everything so that was one of the reasons why some things weren't ready or they're almost just getting ready or they're you know they were getting their readiness as things were happening and I can see that for people that want to be very organized and and ready for it way ahead of time this could be pretty frustrating so all of the countries that are going to be holding the upcoming games, Korea, China, and Japan, they all were attending the observers program also to learn also best practices or practices that weren't working. So we interacted with each other on multiple levels all the day through the whole games. I didn't take part in all the observers program, but as I showed you to my team that I was a part of here, well, they all took part in the observers program too. So they were doing things that I wasn't doing. And if I wasn't in the observers program, I was out meeting other people that were involved with the movement, be it international federation leaders or some of the IOC members that came to the games or even members of the International Paralympic Committee itself. And just a little bit of background on the International Paralympic Committee because I know that there was a I know that there was a pretty big happening about the doping problem that was coming out of Russia and the International Olympic Committee dealt with it in the way that they left it up to the international federations to decide whether or not they would allow or not allow athletes to compete in different events. Whereas the International Paralympic Committee made the decision to ban the entire Russian Federation from Paralympic events. Now, the reason that they could do this, the International Paralympic Committee could ban the entire Russian Federation, was that the national Paralympic committees of each country are the members of the International Paralympic Committee. So there's 200 members of the International Paralympic Committee and each one of those is an NPC or a National Paralympic Committee. Whereas the International Olympic Committee's membership is not made up of just International Olympic Committees. It's made up of IFs, International Federations. It's made up of a variety of different groups. So, so there are two different organizations and they may have been able to deal with that doping situation similarly, but they didn't. And and to be perfectly honest, I have to say that I'm not sure if the International Olympic Committee could have dealt with it the way that the International Paralympic Committee did. It was a huge impact. It opened up a lot of slots for athletes to be able to come and compete at the Games. So 
I mean, if anyone has any questions about that, feel free to throw something in the chat box. And Tony, if you if there's something that I didn't clarify by that, but the Russian Federation, to be really clear, is now banned from all Paralympic events until they get their anti-doping program under control and that it is abiding by the criteria that's established. And so, hey, Candace. Yep. It's, it's Tony. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I actually do have a question. No. I was like, since, you know, once they did get banned, was there, like, tension behind the scenes of the Paralympics? Were, were different countries, you know, going around saying, oh, my gosh, this, this happened? Or, or was there any tension at all? You know, there was conversation about it. I'm, I'm not sure where it would definitely, I would call it tension, but there was conversation about the, the fact that the Russians weren't there and that the doping scandal had been so um, pervasive that it had really filtered into so many different sports, winter and summer sports. And so a lot of the athletes uh, were upset by the fact that, that this had happened and that they were able to, you know, alter a lot of the, I mean, they were able to break open the seals on the bottles really stealthily and then put the seals back <laughs> and so that no one could see it. And, I mean, that's, I think, it's still like a spy movie almost, you know, and and a lot of athletes were uh, visibly shaken by that, but they continued on, you know, with sports that they were there to compete in. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, in both Olympics and Paralympics, there were some people that got caught for doping during the Games. So um, it was, we can't just say that it's Russia just doing some of this doping. You know, it, it's also happening in other countries, but the anti-doping agencies are doing the best that they can to, to really be able to stop that and create clean sport for everyone. Yeah, it was it was a it was a big talk it, topic. It was talked about. So the observers program then also included two days of an inclusion summit. Now the observers program goes on during the Olympic Games also, but they don't have an inclusion summit. The inclusion summit really is about learning best practices and finding out what cities and countries are doing to create access and inclusion for people with disabilities. And that's on all levels, you know, not just the physical level, but also, you know, the attitudinal level, which is a, a huge piece of it, and what kind of education they're doing. So that two-day summit left everyone with a lot of information on, you know, what some of the other cities that are going to be holding the games are doing already. For instance, China. Um, if you looked at the... Top of the, the metal chart, which I'm just going to slide forward here to it. China, I mean, was almost double of what second place was in gold medals. And one of the reasons that is, and they talked about this during the Inclusion Summit, is that they are making a huge investment in their Paralympic athletes and in their community of people with disabilities and their community, their aging community. They really are taking to heart the task of creating access for people with disabilities on all levels. And the big, one of the biggest ones is with sports. They, between Beijing and now, they've trained over 40,000 coaches in Paralympic sport training. That's massive. I mean, I know that the, their population is in the billions, but, but really, if you think about it, they're taking their Paralympians seriously, which a lot of countries aren't. And, and um, the U.S. is actually one that's really fallen behind because they haven't really put the investment forward that a lot of the countries are starting to do out there. Brazil actually was way below in the metal standards in London. You know, I think they were, they were, you know, like 50th or something, and they're in the top 10 here. I mean, one is because they were the hosts of the Games, but they also were 
committed to creating more access in Brazil, which if you think about it, it's really considered a developing country. There's a lot of corruption that is a part of their government and and people with disabilities in the past had really strong stigma as far as being people that were um, not really able to work. In fact, when they were trying to get volunteers for the games, they wanted to have at least 5% of their volunteer force people with disabilities. Oftentimes, people with disabilities would tell them, well, I can't work. And they would ask, the organizers would ask them, well, why can't you work? Well, because I've been told that I'm not capable of working. So it's a pretty ingrained thought that goes into um, people's disability intellectually also, you know, as far as they, you know, the culture tells you you're not capable and they really take that in personally. And, um, and we saw that in Brazil and how they were trying to, they were trying to flip it around. So that, that was pretty interesting too. Um, hey, so many, I actually got a question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to the medal count, was there any surprises in terms of teams that did better in a certain sport that they weren't projected on doing well in? Um, like, was China always pro pro projected to do that well? And was there any no. surprise sports that teams were like, oh my gosh, they were really good at that sport? Yeah, so um, China was not predicted to do that well. And and uh, in 2008 was, was, was the Summer Beijing Games. And, and when, after they held the winter, I mean, the Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games, they really took to task that they were going to do something about improving their placement in the medals with Paralympic sports. And they went way above and beyond what anyone expected of China. And oftentimes people expect the United States to, to be much higher up. And, and for us to be in fourth place and be that far down in the medals, uh, winning 115 medals total is um, is it's a it's a little bit of an embarrassment, and I think also for a lot of the other countries too that that are are below that, I think that they were leaders in the past, and China has really taken taken the the front position on this. Great Britain also coming in second again. That wasn't completely expected because it is such a small country. But um, they had the London Games in 2012, and they did a huge education piece on disability awareness and Paralympic sport in their country before the Games. And they were one of the first games to ever have a sold-out game selling tickets. Now, when China had the Games in 2008, they gave the tickets away, so everything was sold out. But in 2012, Great Britain sold tickets and for the London Games, and they were sold out. And a big piece of it was the education. The other piece was Channel 4. Channel 4 picked up broadcasting the Paralympic Games for the 2012 Games, and they broadcast 500 hours of games for Rio. They broadcasted 700 hours for the Games. and. Between 2012 and 2016, they have continued to educate their market. Channel 4 has continued to keep programming on about Paralympic sport. And also, they have made a commitment to bringing more and more people with disabilities into production of their programs and also starring in their programs. You know, they said that, uh, you know, one of their mottos is that if it happens in life, it should happen on television and in the movies. So they're making a really big effort and setting quotas to be able to bring more people with disabilities to the forefront. It's really, it was really impressive the presentation that Channel 4 did because they are fully committed to building Paralympic sport, but also access for people with disabilities in the media. Now, there's still some struggles going on within government policy, uh, just as we have struggles in the United States with government policy and other countries do, creating full access for people with disabilities. But my thought really is, is that, 
you know, if the media gets on board, then people are going to pay attention and they're going to do something and they're going to realize that disability is something that affects everyone and it's just a life experience. And it's, you know, it's really one of those things that, you know, all through the Olympic Games, we saw the Google Doodle for different sports. But they couldn't say the Olympics because that is a trademark and you can't use it during the games. So they had they called it the fruit games. So the fruit games were going on and they would show different sports that were different days that sports were being highlighted. And at the beginning of the Paralympic Games, they did this doodle, which was huge. I mean, it seems like a little tiny thing, but to get that kind of visibility on Google with a doodle of someone running with two prosthetics is pretty massive as far as for awareness. It makes a huge difference. All right, so I also wanted to show one thing here about um, about the area. So security for the Paralympic Games and during the Olympic Games was the Army, was the military. They were everywhere. The other thing that was everywhere was graffiti. There is nothing that is sacred in Rio from graffiti. There is graffiti on everything. I mean, I think the only thing I didn't see it on, to be perfectly honest, was Christ the Redeemer when we went up to the, the big statue. There wasn't anything on it. And I think it's just because no one can get up there uh, without having gone through several steps to be able to get to the very top where, where the statue is. So um, that was kind of an eye-opening piece for me because I hadn't imagined that graffiti would be on everything. Even, you know, some of their historical monuments had graffiti on it. Um, so the other big teams were Paris, Rome, Budapest, and then, of course, ourselves, Los Angeles. And we kept interacting with each other over the couple of weeks. And so we became friends. Even though we're competitors, we became friends. And we ended up being able to take a picture at the end with uh, some of our competitors. So we're really hoping in 2017, September, that LA gets the honor of holding the games. But it's going to be a dogfight all the way through. And uh, then I just want to say another thing. This is the very first time I've ever had someone driving me around and everywhere. And I, it's a pretty insulating feeling. I was asked at one point, what, um, what did I think of the accessibility in Brazil or actually in Rio? And I, I said, you know, I am not a good person to ask because I have a driver that takes me everywhere. And I don't go more than five or six steps to get in and out of anything. So I actually have no idea what accessibility is like in Rio at all. And and uh, Alex was, was really amazing. And he actually was a tour guide too. So I learned a lot about the, you know, real culture and some of their history and areas that I should go visit if I ever come back. Okay, the logos. So two different logos. That's what the International Olympic Committee asked for is that there are two different logos. London actually had the same logo but different colors, which didn't go over that well, but they ended up being able to keep it. One of the things I really liked about the Paralympic logo was that if you looked at it from above, they, there, it looked like an infinity symbol, a figure eight. It was really pretty beautiful from different angles, and uh, I thought that these logos were really indicative of the synergy that happens during sporting games when when an event like the Olympics and the Paralympics is going on. There's so many great, I don't know, experiences that people have, but it's more relationships that are built. And, and that's one of the, the real upsides of, of the games is that new relationships get built. Like I said, the colors were really reflective of the environment in Rio. And if you look at this, and I'll get that little pencil, look at this right here. This is Christ the Redeemer up on the hill. 
and it pretty much was everywhere. And these were little logos. So you could buy pins with um, all of these different logos for the different sports. And we talked about the metal count and then the metals. So the metals were unique in that if you shook the metal, they made a sound. And gold, silver, and bronze made different sounds. And so this was for people who were blind. And uh, they were unique in that it never has been done before. There's been Braille always on the Paralympic medals, but there's never been sound. So that was that was pretty cool. And then during the games, there's always the Hall of Fame awards that they do. And these are for athletes and coaches that have made significant contributions to Paralympic sport. And it's always a, a pretty well-attended event. And, um, and it's not something that I think a lot of athletes know about because it happens on the backside. You know, my position that I have with LA 2024 had me going to a lot of receptions that I'd never attended before. A couple of them I attended when I was writing about the games, but um, most of them I hadn't been a part of because they're, you know, they're VIP things, and uh, I've never been a VIP before, so this is very eye-opening to me about how the other half lives. <laughs> um, Lonely Planet created an accessible Rio de Janeiro guide, and it's also an e-guide, so you can get it online, which is super helpful. For us, I gave it to our hospitality coordinator, Dwayne Jones, to be able to look at restaurants that we would be going to for dining or entertaining someone to make sure that it was accessible and limit some of the footwork that he would have had to put together to try to figure it out. Because as we all know, I mean, anyone listening who has a disability, and especially someone who uses a wheelchair, knows that when someone goes, oh, yeah, we're accessible, uh, that can mean a lot of things. And um, it's no different from a hotel to a restaurant, you know, to uh, a, rec a place of recreation. Accessibility means a lot of different things. So the work that Lonely Planet did to create this guide was really phenomenal, and they um, they have made that at no cost available to anyone who wants it. it was really a great guide. One of the things that they did to create access, and this was in the airport, but these treads were throughout all of the oh, Paralympic venues and in some of the more common meeting places, as well as throughout the Olympic Park. And these treads were raised up, and as you can see right here, this is what we usually see at the edge of a curb cut so that someone who's blind knows that that's the end of the sidewalk and you're going to be entering the street. So that was actually put in then for a directional piece so that, that someone who's blind would stop right there and realize that they could be going in a couple different directions here. And I know a lot of people in wheelchairs don't really appreciate this, but if you think about someone who's blind, one of the places where they are the most disabled is the airport and out in public places um, because it's just so hard to be able to figure out where you are by sounds or smells or any other way. So having this kind of support makes a huge difference for someone who's blind. And they also had maps in a variety of places throughout the venues as well as the airport and some common places. And the maps had Braille, and they let you know right where you were and where you could go. So this is, again, relatively unique. I have seen some Braille in the airports in the United States. I haven't seen a lot. But I have seen some maps that are raised up so that people who are blind can try to navigate their way through the airports. And then this was started in London, um, 2012, it's a mural that is created in the village that people can sign. And the reason it's created is to support the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities, the UN treaty that was created in 
2009 to be the most comprehensive human rights document ever created, and it was specifically for people with disabilities, but of course it's inclusive of everyone, and making sure that people with disabilities were able to take part in all aspects of society, because people with disabilities traditionally have been left out of most human rights document and civil rights document. I mean, if we reflect back on our own civil rights movement in the United States, in the 60s, people with disabilities were let, left out of those documents, and not until 1990, when the Americans with Disabilities Act was written, were people with disabilities able to then begin to get their civil rights. And so this mural is a, a piece of international human rights. And each country that, or city, actually, that is holding the game has the opportunity to create the mural in any way they want. Now, in London, it was a really big piece. Um, actually, in Sochi, it was a big piece of glass, which was really beautiful, and people could write on that. And so this one is pieces of tile that, again, reflect some of the environment that is so pervasive in, in Rio de Janeiro. And then this is the Olympic Park where the majority of the venues are, they chose, and I think this is a really a last minute, this is a last minute piece that uh, I was thinking this must be a last minute piece because these bricks are the surface that people are walking on throughout the whole park. And they're uneven surfaces because they're settling differently. So they kind of missed the boat on access when it came to creating that surface for the park. And again, I think it was, again, one of those last minute moments where they were scrambling for something that was cost effective and uh, they could do quickly. And they're not even concreted in. I mean, you could kind of wedge something on the edge and flip the brick up if you tried. So um, I think one of those things is to learn from that is that you really need to engage people with disabilities in the conversation of best surfaces to be able to make it so that it's accessible for everyone. But as you can see, the park is really crowded, and it was. It was completely sold out for all of the events once the game started going. Again, they readily admit this. They didn't start really selling tickets. They sold them a little bit for the Paralympic Games, but they really didn't go full force until after the Olympic Games were over, and then they ended up selling 2.1 million tickets when all was said and done. So in the park, there were a variety of places where people could try Paralympic sports. One was sitting volleyball, and they had an area where kids could try it, and then also adults could try it, and they had some goalball going on for people to just, you know, get an idea of what it was like to play a Paralympic sport, which is really the best way for people to learn is to experience something. And uh, there were just kids lining up to be a part of these sports and and roam around the park to try different things, and, and all at no cost. I mean, these are all things that people could do in the park which is really similar to what they had in London, because they had a lot of activities that people could do in the park so that um, anybody who was low on funds wouldn't have to pay for something once they got into the park. And I think in London, I don't know what the tickets were to get in the park, but I know in London it was um, $10, $10 American. And I'm not sure how much that is in pounds, but it was $10 American to be able to get into the park, and then you could experience all of these no cost activities as long as you like as the park was open. So that's a pretty hey, cool Candace. thing. Mm -hmm. So I heard you mention a goal ball. That's all I heard when I was uh -huh. talking about Paralympic Games. Like, can you explain what it is and like why is it such a phenomenon? Like how awesome is that game? Yeah, I will. And I have a picture of goal ball. All right. So goal ball. So goal ball is a, a sport for people who are blind. And they have to wear a mask. Everybody has to wear a mask while they're playing um, so that there cre creates a, an equity 
across the board because some, you know, I mean, it's like with all disabilities, they're different. And blindness, you might have a little bit of vision. It could be shadows. It could be um, you might have your center vision that's gone, but you have peripheral vision. It could be a variety of things. But um, but with goalball and also five-a-side soccer, which also is a sport only for people who are blind, they have to wear masks to cover. And the referees check to make sure that they can't see before the game starts. And it really is a little bit, um, it's a little bit like uh, any of the net sports, like soccer or um, um, a little bit like rugby too, uh, wheelchair rugby, in that the, the mission is to get the ball into the net. And the ball has a little bell in it. So the audience needs to be completely quiet while they're playing. And you have three people, as you can see in the picture, and the people with the ball, one person picks up the ball and they roll the ball however they want to, either slowly or quickly, to try to get it into the net of the other team. And then that's how they score. Did you get to watch any of it? No, all I did was I catch up on YouTube and seeing some of it on a uh just on YouTube uh-huh. and streaming. I mean, it looks so fun. I mean, just seeing it, and then everyone on the crowd was just going crazy for it, too. I mean, I think BuzzFeed, one of the, the the big websites online, just posted so much about it. So I had to go look and find what it is. Well, and I have to tell you, one of the things that we talked about during the, um, during the games was that there are several events that would benefit if, you had a camera from above for spectators to be able to see on the big screen. And it would make it even more exciting because you're looking at goalball from from straight on like this. But if you could see it from above, you could even see more strategy that's being involved, as well as Baccia. Baccia is another game that has so much strategy involved in it. And these athletes are the most disabled people involved in sport in the whole Paralympics. So most of these athletes have either cerebral palsy or some other neurological condition and they don't they don't roll the balls with their hands at all. In fact, you know, like when you would watch nor like watch Baccia for non disabled people, they roll the balls and they try to get the ball is closest to the white ball. And in in the wheelchair bacha, that is not what happens. You can see right here there's it looks a little bit like a tube, but um it's really a trough that the ball gets set in by the second person on the team, this one, who is non disabled and sets up the trough so that the person who is going to push the ball, they tell them how to set it up, and then on their helmet, they have a pointer that is able to just lightly touch the ball, it rolls down the trough, and then out onto the course right here. And these people that are helping them set up the trough for the ball, they're not allowed to look at the the area behind them at all. They have to keep their back to the field of play because it's the athlete that has to direct where the ball goes. And so that that actually became um, like a, a penalty during one of the events that we were watching because they were saying that, um, you know, one of those um, one of those coaches, we were calling them coaches because they didn't have another name for them, but they one of the coaches they said looked at the field of play and they don't have any, you know, instant replay. So you can't really tell. So it it's kind of was by um it was a subjective vote by the uh by the officials and then they decided that um the person didn't and they were able to continue. But this game is a phenomenal game to watch and again it should have an overhead camera 
so that you can really be able to see it fully from above because there's so much that goes on right here in this area where there's where everybody's clustered. And because they're so clustered and the chairs are big and they have equipment, sometimes it's really hard to see what's happening in there. But again, another sport. I don't know how much playtime it got on the um, on the NBC coverage, but uh, it really should have been one of the main sports that people watch because it was super exciting. Um, one of the things that was a huge issue, and we talked about this in the observers program, that they made a mistake. So they built all of the accessible seating for people in wheelchairs with the idea that the railing was for people standing up. So as you can see, the rails are right in front of me. Like my view looks like I'm looking through jail or I have to look through this really small little section between the handrail and and the, the rail below. Huge problem for people sitting and watching the games. Two venues in this upper left hand corner, two venues had the plexiglass so that you could see through and be able to watch the game, which was ideal. But once they put that all these rails in, they realized that they had made a mistake. But they didn't want to spend the money to take them out and fix them. And that was a huge problem. It was one of those things that really just put a damper on everybody's ability to be able to watch the games. I mean, the other thing was that over here, they had the seating, and they had two seats together with a little area in between the two seats, and then two more seats where someone in a wheelchair could sit. So again, you weren't able to really sit with all your buds in wheelchairs, right, lined up. You had to be spaced out with two chairs in between um, because they were bolted to the ground and you couldn't move them. So, and that was again another access problem that was something that if they had really thought through it and worked with people with disabilities, they probably would have been enlightened to the problem here and that would not be the case for when the games came on. So, and that was, it was it kind of, it was distressing, you know, to be someone in a wheelchair and not be able to see the games very well and know that the Paralympic Games are all about people with disabilities. And some of the other things that they had going on, they had some adaptive surfing that is a program in the area and some accessible pieces that could take you to the beach. Now, Elena Nichols, who was a kayaker during the Paralympic Games and also has competed in winter and summer games and won gold medals in skiing and basketball, was there competing in kayaking, and she went out for a try of some adaptive surfing. I'm hoping that we have an opportunity to have her come and talk about adaptive surfing on, on one of the adapting live shows because it's a really rapidly growing sport, and it's pretty exciting. And uh, this is a board that she actually had never, this type of board she'd never used before. So it was pretty unique to what the adaptive surfing community in Brazil was putting together. And um, and it worked pretty well. The The waves that day were pretty big, and she ended up getting towed out with a, a jet ski to be able to catch some waves, which she was successful with. And that was a really awesome experience because I think, again, she may have been the first person that is a sit-down surfer that uh, gotten towed out to catch a wave. Usually it's a non-disabled big wave surfer. <laughs> um, so, oh, the Olympic flame. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Olympic and Paralympic flame. So we all know the Olympic flame comes from Greece and runs around the world and gets to where it needs to be to light the cauldron during the Olympic Games. Well, the Paralympic Games are not really allowed to use that process, and they needed to come up with another way that the flame would come to, would originate and come to the host city. And so there's a heritage flame at Stoke Mandeville. When Stoke Mandeville in England is the home of the Paralympic Games. In 1948, the Summer Olympic Games were being held in London and 
Stoke Mandeville at the time was a rehabilitation hospital, of which it still is, but then it was a rehabilitation hospital for returning veterans of World War II. And Sir Ludwig Goodman wanted to help these veterans recover, and he used sport. And so when the London Games were happening in 1948, he decided to have the International Games for the Disabled during that time, and that really was the birth of the Paralympic Games. Later on, years down the road, the name Paralympic, which means alongside Olympic, was formed and the Paralympic Committee was formed, but the home has always been Stoke Mandeville. So the heritage flame lives in Stoke Mandeville in England, and how they lit this flame in Rio was really interesting and unique, was that they had people all over the world text this number and they got them going all at once and and once the texting took off it created this heat and the heat brought the flame to this cauldron and lit the flame for the Paralympic Games in Rio. So it's pretty unique. And then five cities outside of Rio were chosen to have the torch and the flame come to those cities, travel around those cities, and then eventually come to opening ceremonies and light the cauldron. So that was um, that was pretty exciting and unique. I think a lot of people probably think the flame just comes from Greece, and that's um, the same as the Olympics, and it's not. It's not the same. There's quite a few things that aren't the same as the Olympics and the Paralympics. Another thing I wanted to show was. Um, some ideas that they had on accessibility in the bathrooms. I mean, using a wheelchair, I'm always like, how can I get in the bathroom? Will I be able to get in the bathroom? Will I be able to use the bathroom? Um, Because i got to get my wheelchair in the bathroom. So I thought that this candle that I found in a couple of the toilets was really awesome because you really didn't need to push anything with your thumb. Like so many, it's a button now or um, grab a hold of something to flush the toilet. You could actually just have a hand or even an elbow that could push on this lever against the wall, and it pushed the button that was right here, and that flushed the toilet. And I thought, that's really cool. And then they had these toilet seats that had this big opening so that if you needed to be able to reach anything, you could. And I found that quite unique and very effective. So um, two new sports, canoe, kayak, and triathlon were beautiful in beautiful venues. And we already talked about Spatia and Goldball, which Tony, you thought was pretty awesome, which I fully appreciate. And wheelchair tennis. So there's a there's some you know, there's some talk now that the classification system for wheelchair tennis is is expanding so much so that the quad division is not necessarily bringing people in that are reflective of what someone who quadriplegic might be. And I know that that's a, a pretty big statement, but Watching these games, I was having trouble figuring out on the team on this side of the net, and I forget which team that was, how someone would have had four limbs involved because it really looked like arms and hands were working really well, whereas over on the U.S. side, um, both David and Nick, uh, David is quadriplegic and Nick uses a power chair, it was pretty evident what was, you know, how their disability was much more close to quadriplegia than the disabilities on the other side of the net. These are things that the International Paralympic Committee is going to have to look at. The other thing that they're starting to look at is they're thinking about eliminating power wheelchairs as part of wheelchair tennis, which would, I think, from my perspective, and it's just my perspective, would be a tragedy because Over the years, we've really seen a lot of the higher disabilities, people that are more severely disabled, eliminated. And um, 
and their sports going to the wayside to bring in more able, disabled athletes, if that makes sense. But uh, we're seeing that in wheelchair tennis. We're also beginning to see some of that in wheelchair rugby or quad rugby. And um, and so that was one of the things I was hoping we could talk about a little bit with the, with our rugby players, uh, which we will have a chance in the future to do. But it's, you know, one of those controversial things like the doping classification always is an evolving situation and it's something that that we have to keep an eye on to make sure that we're not eliminating athletes from being permanently disabled athletes because that's the criteria of being permanently disabled. That we're not eliminating permanently permanently disabled athletes from being able to compete in these sports. Another Real standout from these games was the Iranian men's sitting volleyball team. A few years back, they found a young man who had not left his home in a very long time, who is actually the third tallest person in the world. And he had damaged his pelvis at the age of 15 in a bicycle accident and one leg ended up being shorter than the other and not being able to walk very well. He was quite isolated for many years because moving around was difficult for him and access. And the coach of the Iranian men's city volleyball team discovered him and brought him into the team structure and the sport. And he has been a phenomenal sitting volleyball player. I mean, his reach is way over the height of the net, but he's also quite quick. And I have to you think, as I reflected on his life before and his life now being the center of attention as a volleyball player in this arena, what it's like for him, you know, how he's feeling being outcast like that and now being fully embraced. And I think a lot of people with disabilities have those kind of feelings often, especially when you have an acquired disability that you're in. You're, you become sometimes isolated and feeling a bit like an outcast. And then once you start to get mobility again, you begin to realize that there's a life out there and then people are beginning to pay attention to you. And I can only hope that this is a positive experience for him, but I'm sure it's one that takes time to adjust to. But the Iranian men's sitting volleyball team ended up winning the gold medal. And it wasn't just because it was that one phenomenal player. Uh, it was because the team actually began to work really well together. And, and uh, he was like the weapon, you know, the secret weapon towards the end. And it was really exciting to watch because the people of Rio love their volleyball. Love their volleyball. <laughs> it was, uh, honestly, this was probably... 15 minutes after the game was over, and you can see this dance have emptied out considerably, but all those seats for all the games were packed because they just, they don't care who's playing. They love their volleyball. And then I had the opportunity to be able to do a little bit of sightseeing, and this is a picture taken by Alex, my phenomenal driver, from the top of Sugarloaf Mountain, back down on the city of Rio. And if you watch the games, you probably heard about these things called the favelas, which is where some of the poorest people live. And I am circling one of the favelas because, as Alex told me, the people that live in the favelas are some of the poorest people, but they have some of the best views because they build these these shacks all the way up the side of the mountains and the hills, and they go up, 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 and they have the most phenomenal views of Rio, of even the most wealthy people. And this lit up display of Rio at night is, I think, a great example of that. As you can see, how the lights go up the hill. The more they go up the hill, the more that's a favela. And this over here on the far right is Christ the Redeemer. And that's the hill that the Christ the Redeemer is. It's 
the infamous statue that you see always in pictures when you see pictures of Rio. And we had an opportunity to go up there myself and one of my teammates, Clayton Fresh, who is the founder and CEO of Angel City Sports and Angel City Games, one of the groups in Los Angeles that's really trying to get a lot of adaptive sport going in the L.A. area. And a friend had to lay on the ground to be able to get this picture for us because it was uh, so tall. Christ's Beamer is so tall. And we took a um, we took a tram up the hill and going through the jungle, the Tijuca jungle. And then once we reached the top, you actually have to ride two escalators to get up to Christ the Redeemer. So if your wheelchair is too wide, it won't fit on the escalator and um, you won't be able to get up to see the full effect of what it's like to see Rio um, from that view. And it really is a pretty spectacular view. I mean, it's, it's right along with the view of the sugar loaf because the sugar loaf isn't as high, but it has also the same view, but just from another perspective. So um, that actually brings me to the last slide which obrigado means uh, thank you. And uh, that was uh, one of the words that I was able to learn while I was in Rio de Janeiro for the games. It was a spectacular experience for me. I think that the games were a complete success for the people of Rio, the people of Brazil, and everyone that was taking part in it. The athletes all had performances that were not marred by any problems from the ones that I was able to speak to. Uh, the food I heard was not exceptional. A lot of people brought their own food and athletes do that quite often because they're always afraid they're going to not have what they need to eat that they're used to. And, um, and sometimes you don't have to use it and sometimes you do. And this time a lot of the athletes weren't able to eat a lot of the food that was in the dining hall because it just didn't agree with them. So they ate the stuff that they brought. And um, and I have to say that I'm feeling really grateful that I had the opportunity to experience the games from this perspective as an observer's program and seeing back of the house, front of the house, and all the things in between of how a games was put on because I have a much better appreciation for how the games happen, and and also what the opportunity is with the games. The opportunity really for people with disabilities is above and beyond massive and huge. We can change the way people see disability into such a positive light through sport and through the games, and I'm greatly appreciative to have taken part in that and to hopefully bring the um, part of a team, but to hopefully get the honor of hosting the games and see if we can then take these games to the next level. So we're right at the top of the hour. I was a nonstop lather mouth on, on Rio de Janeiro and the Paralympic Games. No, not at all. So, <laughs> <Good> job. <laughs> thank you, Tony. I, um, and thank you for the questions that you had. Did you, do you have any other ones about it? Maybe? No, I'm, no, no, actually pretty good. You answered some of the ones I really want to know, especially goalball. So. Uh-huh. So, yeah, but, pretty um, phenomenal. But no, thank you for everything today. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. And everybody, um, thanks for tuning in. And again, I apologize that we did not have the rugby players here because I know there were people that wanted to listen to rugby. But uh, this is, a, I think, a pretty good backstory of the games and some of the things that were real positive about the game and some of the things that they had problems with. So, and hopefully we were able to answer some questions about some of the sports that are out there. I mean, I don't know if NBC showed any of the men sitting volleyball, but the player from Iran was that guy. I think had he had the opportunity and not been injured at such a young age and not had the proper care to be able to heal his pelvis, he probably would have been an athlete in one of the sports that requires height, and he would have been phenomenal. 
but as a sitting volleyball player, he's really totally rocking the house. But, um, all right. uh, but thank you so much, Candice. Um, thank Absolutely. you for everyone. Jo- thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this presentation was recorded and will be archived at the end of the week. Uh, if you, if you want to view it, just visit youtubecom foundation. Uh, we hope to hear from everyone next week and join us again next month. Uh, thank you and thank you, Candice. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Tony, for being my host and and everybody for hanging in there. I hope you all have a great day, and we'll look forward to seeing you and hearing hearing from you next month. Great. Take care. Bye.